Good morning. If y'all want to take your seats, my name is Nola, and I am a member here at the Springs. If you want to grab your Bible or there are Bibles in the seat in front of you, we are going to read Acts 2, verses 42 through 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Good morning. Hey, y'all. My name is John. I serve as pastor here at the Springs. I am really excited to be with y'all. If you've been hanging out with us for the past, I don't know, a few weeks, we've started a series through the book of Acts. If you're unfamiliar with Acts in your Bible, it's part of the New Testament. It's the sixth book in the New Testament. And it outlines the early church's history. How did this movement of faith go from a Jewish rabbi claiming to be the Messiah to 12 followers to 120 waiting in an upper room to the movement of the church of Jesus Christ that you saw then that would overturn empires and would still be today? Last week, we talked about this, this interesting theme of revival. Like that's Christian language for what happens when like the Holy Spirit comes, brings transformation, and a whole bunch of people want to follow Jesus. In light of that context, anybody hear about what has happened at Auburn University this past week? Anybody familiar? Okay. A couple people, like, all right, War Eagle. I applied to Auburn, did not go, but loved it. Great place. A beautiful thing happened, though. I want to show you guys something. It's about 25 seconds. It's a different couple social media clips. To give context to it, though, it's the start of school. A bunch of students went and gathered for a night of worship teaching and praise. They brought in wonderful premiere um, music, teaching, the whole thing. The night culminated, though, in a whole bunch of folks who likely grew up in the South in what we might refer to as cultural Christianity. At the end of that night, over 2,000 students had faith in Christ, and they literally spent all night long until the hours of the morning baptizing them in the water just outside the space where the gathering had taken place. A beautiful, inspiring moment of revival. But let's just look at some of these images real quick to give you guys a little frame and a context. So this is a sideways shot of where the gathering took place. We'll pause here. This beautiful thing. I have the privilege of knowing the communicators that went to be a part of it, and they talked about how this was a really sacred and a special moment. You'll see at the top, though, of this Instagram photo, it's posted by Grant Trout. I have no idea who that is, but I feel like I'd really like him. In response to seeing hundreds staying up through the night in the middle of it, Grant is online and he is connecting this moment of revival to something different and distinct. He's gonna have a theme of the term he'll use is discipleship. And it's what we're gonna focus on and talk about today. But let me read this with you. Not sure if I've ever experienced chains breaking free off hundreds of college students. Throughout the night, it would become, estimates, 2,000. College students deciding to go all in with Jesus and get baptized like I saw tonight. And just like Jay Pecluda and Jenny Allen, two teachers said, now discipleship starts. Fascinating. In this beautiful moment of revival and baptism, and they're already talking about what comes next. Their language, beautiful language, is discipleship. Grant continues, a moment of faith is just the beginning. Now, get plugged into a church, find community, get discipled by other believers. Movement, each one, teach one. Here's the reason I want to start with that. It's a fascinating thing to think about. In the middle of this massive moment of, let's just say it's blessed by God, revival. The Spirit is breaking free, changing the lives of countless college students. 
And there's this wonderful celebration. There's like that special sense of connection in a sacred night where you wake up the next morning. Oh, better yet, you never went to sleep. And you just know that was sacred. But in the moment, in their message, in their meeting, the theme of it was, this is beautiful. But it's only the beginning. It's only the beginning. Like, you have to have the theme. Like, they're coming, and with this, like, hey, man, beautiful moment of revival, of faith, of salvation, of justification. All about it. But they're saying, this is just the beginning. There's a whole nother phase, to use the language of Grant Trout, that saints have used for centuries, of discipleship. To say that differently, the church should never settle for just believing. The journey continues in the becoming. See, becoming like Jesus Christ is part of this Christian journey. But for so many of us, that's that's not really our experience, even included inside the church. Like perhaps you, maybe you didn't have a miraculous moment like that at college. I didn't. But you had some moment. Maybe it was at a camp. Maybe it was at a church. Maybe it was at a conference. Maybe it was at home. Maybe it was at your, your bedside with your parents when you were little. You had a moment of, I am no longer the same. I am new. I am different. And there's all this excitement and this joy and this energy. Christians call it being on fire for God. And then oftentimes, older Christians say, hey, enjoy that phase while you got it, because it's going to go away. And for many of us, there's this beautiful moment of belief. But our life, if we're honest, this journey of faith, it has a tendency to plateau. Like we start in faith and we have this beautiful picture of, okay, I have met Jesus. I want to become like him. I want to live like him. I want to learn this sacred path of following him. If he is my big brother, my savior, and he says he's my friend, if the Holy Spirit indwells me, helps me, counsels me, empowers me, And God the Father says, I can approach his throne with grace. I want to live into that. I want more. Christians have had moments and times where that was their honest experience. But then maybe five years goes by, 10 years, three decades. And oftentimes what can happen for me or for others is we end up just looking to the past. Or we say, no, I remember the moment I walked the aisle. I remember the moment I was at camp or the the great sermon or the conference I went to or the worship song or the special moment in God's creation or lakeside. We're pointing to these past events because in the present we feel like we've really plateaued. Here's the concern. Jesus would come and talk about life with him being life to the full. He'll literally use language about a good tree bears good fruit. He'll talk about what does that lend itself to. The language he'll use is the good life. He'll say, I've come that you may have life and have it to the fullest. It's kind of like a picture of a beautiful vine. He'll use this imagery, because it was an agricultural one, of walking around where vines, where he would say, hey, whoever abides in me, I in him, they will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. And he gives this vision, this biblical invitation that your life and my life is meant to be like this lush, growing garden. Not perfect, not all together, but legitimately beautiful, legitimately maturing, forming into his image. Not just belief, but becoming. But for many of us, we sit here with an honest sense of disillusionment because we know he offers us this. But far too often, our experience is this. Like there's, and if you can't see it, it's, it's kind of like a, an alive but nowhere flourishing plant. There's a beauty in the roots. There's greenery. There's the magical moment. And, then, and again, this is alive. These vines have grown. And look, look, there is life and there's fruit. To where we come and we point to the past mostly. 
But we have the moment like, okay, okay. This was the time when our, uh, uh, our college freshmen went off to school. And they called us because the first weekend they said, hey, mom, hey, dad. I wanted to thank you for instilling in me a sense of I need a local church family. I'm going to start discerning that for myself today. And you sit there and you point and you're like, that's a beautiful moment. It's a wonderful moment. Or you point to a moment where like, hey, let's sit down here. This is like Christmas six years ago. Six years ago where you say marriage was falling apart. Kids were old enough to know something was off, but they didn't fully understand it. Marriage was falling apart. And I wanted out. But I knew God had a different way, and I believed health was actually possible. A beautiful moment. But, but instead of beginning to normalize a pathway of discipleship, of health, they're infrequent and they point to the past. The reason I talk about that is that was so much of my experience, and I imagine, and of ours. The reason we are in the book of Acts is to see this beauty in understanding who is the church, how are we meant to live, how does the Holy Spirit empower, what are we meant to do? Like, is this just a Sunday morning gathering? Or is this a part of a sacred movement of God, of committed believers with one another, continuing what they started? The same substance with some 21st century style. Why? The lives that we will look at and read about through this journey of Acts, by the, by the power of God, they look way more like this than this. But I think if we're honest, your life, my life, we have a tendency for our life to look way more like this like that. So we've seen in Acts 2, the beginning of this beautiful chapter, this moment of Pentecost where the Holy Spirit descends, God comes in power. He compels people with a heart of worship and witness. Last week, we saw Peter's preaching. He gives this sermon where he, he, he summarizes it. This is my summary. You killed him. Real intense. You killed him. Out of love, he died to save you. Believe. So you see what happens to this people. At the beginning, the Holy Spirit falls on 120. At the end of where we were last week, there's over 3,000. There is a gathering of the local church there in Jerusalem. And you wonder, okay, what do they do at that moment? They've just had this massive revival. They've done their version of we are all through the night. We're baptizing people. They brought the cars out to keep the lights on into the river. If they could have done it, I guess they would have had torches or something. Do they stop there? No. They go all in. On discipleship. Discipleship is a word many of us have heard. You, you might have used terms like apprenticeship, becoming like. It's this invitation of becoming like Christ, from belief, becoming. Terms that a lot of us are familiar with are the words sanctification. A word I appreciate is the word formation. Discipleship is the process of, by the power of the Holy Spirit, being formed into the image of God for his glory and the good of others and your well-being being formed does the early church stop at conversion no belief is beautiful it's just incomplete it is meant to be combined with a life of becoming so you see this early church formed a family of brothers and sisters in the faith, in mutual submission and care to one another under the guidance of God, coming and saying, will you help me become like Jesus? Will you help form me into the image of the one that has changed everything? It's with that I want to talk about who we must be. Why? If I'm honest about my life, 
I, I think I have a tendency to teach and if I'm honest, to live. But I will preach. That is the vision of Jesus. That is the invitation of Jesus. And that's true. But my life in practice far more resembles this. The elders at the Springs, we all in agreement know as our church wants to help form one another to be like Christ, to disciple one another in this beautiful and sacred faith. We know that we want to lead and we have a tendency to preach and to teach and it looks like that. But many of us experience it like this. And that's under our leadership and our care. We are so excited in looking at this for a framework of formation to invite you, to invite me, to be an actual family of formation. We're going to look at Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, to understand this theme of what it means to be a family of formation. We're going to do this over the course of two weeks. I wanted to put it into one sermon, and it's just not possible. We're going into two, and I still went long in the first service. The first thing that we are going to see that is required of a family of formation is practices, practices. You will see this new people of God, the church, orient their life around individual and communal practices of pursuing Jesus. The second theme that we are gonna look at next week are the principles. What are the principles at a very high level that undergird or go throughout or act as a spirit-led momentum of the beautiful institution of the church? Not one, a place of hypocrisy or oppressive and cruel authority, but one of imperfect but spirit-led helping one another into maturity. But today, as we look at practices, we're going to look at four of them. We'll primarily focus on verse 42. The four practices that we are going to see, there's a practice of truth, there's a practice of community, there's a practice of health, and then there's a practice of the disciplines. But let me read 42 through 47. Again, the primary focus will be verse 42, and we'll work our way through the practices. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Um, that's what they did. That's what they did. You know, this is what God did. And awe came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together. That means there is a difference between believing and living together, and there is a connection from the belief to living together, and they had all things in common. We'll talk about this more next week. This is ridiculous right here. That means the church was a place where people got along not out of compulsion, but actual compassion and care. See, this is a group full of people from wildly different ethnic backgrounds, and their prejudice was next level, even to our modern-day racism today. This is a place where men and women, patriarchal culture, equal dignity, equal honor. This is a place kids restored. The wealthy didn't run the meeting. The poor were not excluded one family. Only the Spirit of God can do that. They actually loved one another. I'll prove it to you. This is crazy. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. I have surplus, you have deficit. Here. Now the question is, did they do this out of like first century guilt trips? Where they sat there like, man, I feel really bad. Should I do that? No. There was like a radical spirit of generosity, vulnerability, and transparency. And they liked it. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. They go from this gathering of thousands then they are gathering at homes and they are eating meals. 
And how are they receiving these moments? The people who have and the have-nots. They're glad. They have generous hearts. That word, more accurately, is like simplicity. It's speaking to a sense of divine contentment to where my excess meets your need, and it's a privilege to do it. That's crazy. They really enjoyed one another. These meals, besides the breaking of bread, we'll talk about that in the communion or the Eucharist, the first century church had what they called love feasts. Love feasts. Like if you put, hey, New Braunfels, we're going to gather for a love feast, could get weird really fast if you put that on social media. Right? Really fast. Some of y'all are like, I'm interested in that. We're really glad you're here. Okay? You're welcome here. You know what the purpose of these love feasts were? It was their version of a potluck. They literally just showed up and enjoyed one another, laughed together, and ate a good meal. You remember the last time you left a gathering of friends? Full. Content. Happy. They made a practice of this, of building in life with one another. See, see, if you thought the local church was that, man, my heart and your heart would lean in more. It's who we are meant to be and become. Praising God and having favor with all the people. In their becoming, God brings blessing. Many of us chase the blessing so it fuels our becoming. Let me live on the emotion that fuels the devotion. No, the biblical path is, is the other way. In the becoming, God says, I'm going to meet you. The language of Jesus' half-brother, James, he'll say it this way. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. The language of Jesus' other half-brother, Jude, he will say, we build ourselves up in our most holy faith. That's intimacy with God. In prayer, by drawing near. It is this invitation, like in becoming, you are experiencing God. And the Lord added to their number day by day. Do you see that? Day by day, second repetition of this phrase. What if we did this like on the daily? I bet three-fourths of this room would be gone. And I don't say that in self-righteousness. I say it in like honest reflection and conviction. I wonder what God could do with one-fourth of us all in. I wonder the joy, the peace. You remember? Because he says, life with me is life abundant. The Apostle Paul will build on this, and he'll say, when you walk by the Spirit, which is other language for drawing near to God, practicing the pursuit of God, he'll say, you live the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, self-control. It's all this beautiful, lush life. It's a life of enjoyment, of fun, absolutely in the midst of hardship. But there is a practice of becoming in a family of formation. And the becoming, God can't help but evoke blessing. Does that mean that there is some promise of prosperity? No. The early church will suffer, they will be persecuted, they will be hunted, they will be murdered, and they will flourish. What if we were courageous enough to say, Holy Spirit, help me, I'm willing. Whew. That would be a church worth gathering with. That shared, we've seen the text. The part I want to talk about today, this is a family of formation. I want to look at the practices. If you remember two weeks ago, we talked about the day of Pentecost where the Holy Spirit descends in power. We talked about how every church wants to be an Acts 2 church. But churches have personalities just like people. And some churches want to lean. And like, we are a church of power. And they kind of want to live at the beginning of Acts 2. Power. And this may be you or your background. Pentecostal, charismatic, whatever be the most honoring language to describe that. Power. And then there's other churches who they want to stay at kind of like the end of Acts 2. And they want to say, we are people of practice. High knowledge. High doctrine. High missions. Caring for others. The power stuff makes us nervous. We are both. 
How do you live out both imperfectly, submitted to the Spirit of God, in pursuit of Him? We've seen power. Today I want to talk about practice. This takes us back to verse 42. This is foundational for where we'll see our time today. And they. Who's the they? I love the Bible. The they is not just the apostles. It's not just the 120. What does that mean? It's not just the superstar church leaders who do this. This was over 3,000 folks, many of them with a Jewish background, but absolutely some with a Gentile. What does that mean? Some of these folks don't know up from down when it comes to God. They just showed up, and there was this crazy moment of people speaking in their language, telling them about the good news of Jesus Christ. They're like, I don't know what it is, but I'm in. This word devoted, it means all in. They are devoted to, one, the apostles' teaching, two, the fellowship, three, the breaking of bread, four, the prayers. The devotion stays consistent throughout. Why does that matter? As we'll see, you and I have a tendency to be devoted to some, but not all. I am gifted at partiality when it comes to my spiritual journey. I love, I love the personal moments of intimacy with God, reading my Bible, sitting in prayer. Going to another version of an extroverted community group where I got to sit there and lean in when I'm already tired and likely confess my sins. AKA, that's called the fellowship right here. I don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. Do I have an invitation by God to be devoted to some, but not all? No. But that's why at times my life more reflects this than that. That's why we are invited in this path of formation for health. That shared. Let's look at these four things. The first one being the apostles' teaching. The first practice that they oriented the early church around was the practice of truth. You see, the early church, through teaching, elevated what we might call right doctrine. What is doctrine? It was a sacred set of beliefs. Sacred set of beliefs. Jesus would summarize it with this. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. What is the truth? He is the truth, and following him is truth. What does that look like? Leading in a way of life, and what does it evoke? The life. So they're teaching. This would include the Old Testament, Old Testament, and really showing by the power of the Holy Spirit, here's Christ on every page. To the present teachings, Jesus had taught them for three years. They'd been gathering. They are giving their teachings now with fresh eyes. And then what Jesus promises them, the Holy Spirit will come and continue the teaching, which brings us the entirety of the rest of Holy Scripture. It's truth. Why does it matter that they orient themselves around truth? Because they had been discipled in a culture of lies. We exist in a culture that disciples in lies. Let me give you some first century examples. There's this tension, law and grace. Law and grace. What must I do to be saved? Law. Follow perfectly. 683, rabbis discuss it. Moral laws, civil laws, ceremonial laws of the Old Testament. Follow them perfectly. And then hope it works out with Yahweh. Law. Jesus' whole thing. His whole thing. You can't. I'll die for it. I will suffer for you. I will become sin for you. I will rise for you to reunite you with the Father. You will not operate like a slave trying to go to a master. You will exist as a son or a daughter. Believe. First law, or excuse me, truth and lies, which one's right? Law or grace? Do you see that? Like that's a first century. You have to untangle over time the lies that we come to believe. What's one that happens to a bunch of us today? This is one we've referenced, like, you are what you do. This is a lie that our, especially Western American culture, is soaked in. You are what you do. Do you know rates of depression skyrocket, skyrocket in two communities? One, people following their retirement. Why? Because I was what I did. Now who am I? Another time, oftentimes, 
when moms make a decision to stay at home and they leave a corporate job. That's not my anecdotal opinion. The research is evident. Why is that? Because we are discipled in a culture that says you are what you do. If you are trying hard and you still get a B, you are not as good or as worthy or as valuable. If you are trying the best, but you have not reached this status, you're not as good or as worthy or as valuable. What is the truth? That's a lie from the pit of hell. By faith in Christ, your identity is how God sees you, not how they see you. Like my identity is not in the performance of a sermon, the growth of the springs, what you think of me. I'm loved. I already am enough. I have the validation of the Father. I'm not who I once was. Does it mean I live in that moment perfectly all the time? No. But that's why it takes a family in formation. But do you see a tension here? They're a community of truth committed to this. Why? Against a culture of lies. You cannot navigate it alone, which takes us to the second practice. We've seen truth. The second practice, the fellowship is the language that the Holy Spirit uses here through the author Luke. The fellowship, this is language that literally speaks to sharing in like a sacred partnership. It, it's this. It is life together. See, I, I kind of had a background where you like trust Christ, you walk an aisle, you believe in him, and then it's kind of you and Jesus and you try to figure it out. That could not be further from the truth of the rhythm of the New Testament. This fellowship, how much life together was there? How much vulnerability and sharing was there? All of it. All of it. Like this would have been moments where to realize who didn't have need. There was a father with a wife bringing kids to a communion meal. And that day, he barely had enough food for his kids, let alone to contribute to the potluck for others. You know how much vulnerability and courage it would take to do that? That absolutely happened. Our, our version of that would be like, okay, man, it's, it's December. It was a harder year. We didn't stay on budget. Christmas has come, and you and a spouse look at one another, and you're like, hey, Christmas this year, it's, it's just on credit card. You don't want to tell your kids. You don't want to tell the extended family. You don't want them to know. But you and your wife, you intentionally, you don't get yourself many things. And you sit there, and as they are unwrapping presents, and they're smiling, you are thinking about, I don't know how I'm going to pay it off because the budget is already really tight. And they had enough courage to show up to their version of the community group and be like, hey, guys, you can see my budget. You can see how much I tithe, my generosity. You can see whatever you want. But can I tell you where I'm fearing right now? Why? We exist in a culture of individualism. It's about me or me and God, and that's my business. You stay in your lane. I'll stay in mine. Don't, don't come in at hyper-individualism. The Bible invites us into healthy community. Why? To combat a culture of individualism. First century Jews, they already had far more of a communal identity than we do today as Western Americans. And it was still hard for them. That's why to talk about a moment like that, of radical generosity that requires vulnerability, transparency, and joy, they were glad to do it. This was not compulsion. Real compassion. That's beautiful. That is beautiful. And, and it's also too, you know where lies grow best, going back to our practice of truth? You know where lies grow best? In isolation. Some of the most entrenched lies that have formed me and discipled me were the things that I never told people. Some of the greatest healing came when I began to say, can I tell you something that I'm terrified to share? A family of formation, becoming someone, practices truth, practice community. Third one, the language, Luke goes on to say, the breaking of bread. This is a reference to communion, or depending on your background, the Eucharist, right? Where you come down for a moment of reflection. They would have known. Jesus had given a teaching. Hey, in your future, when you gather 
as often as you gather, do this in remembrance of me. Communion was beautiful. It was a sacred act that represents so many things. It points to the second coming of Christ, to the promise of love and forgiveness in a new covenant, a reminder that the law is gone, that forgiveness is here. And communion necessitates, demands self-reflection, self-examination. To where the early church, they would be gathering in homes And then the moment of the table would occur. Formation around the table. And there would be a sacred self-examination. The Apostle Paul will later go on and say, if you are not at peace with God or with others, do not take communion. It was a warning. Why? When you do so, you eat or drink judgment to yourself. If you want to go look at it, it was literally making some people physically ill. Why? They were violating the beauty of Christ and then coming to claim that they are living into it. The confusion. So what would that mean if you came and there's this recurring pattern at meals and tables of self-examination and reflection? That's how you have actual help. Like Jesus would say, hey man, if you have issues with others or sin unrepented before God, you deal with that first before you come and remember this. Imagine how healthy families would be if that was a practice. Imagine how healthy community groups would be if that was a practice. Because you know what it would do? It would normalize two things in the life of a church. Two things, and this is beautiful. A radical spirit of forgiveness. Because communion is realizing he broke his body, he shed his blood. I am forgiven. I already am forgiven. A radical spirit of forgiveness. And it would normalize this beautiful spirit of repentance. I'm already forgiven. I know who I am. But hey, this. This this did not reflect who I am. The early church, the way we think about church now, backbiting, politics, culture, infighting, all the dysfunction. You've been a part of it. Like that's right. You get that? Gossip dies at the table. Faking unity dies at a sacred table. There's practices. If you want to form a family where there's a becoming like Christ, there's practices. Truth combat the lies. Community to combat the individualism. It's not just you. Health to combat my tendency towards tolerated sin, conflict, disunity with God, dislove with others. The fourth one takes us to what is the fourth pillar? And remember, this was what they devoted themselves to. And then what did God do? Awe came upon every soul. The prayers. The prayers. I'll refer to this as the disciplines. See, the prayers as a reference to fixed our prayer. Jews, especially at this time, this room is predominantly Jews, those gathering here, they had fixed our prayer. Most scholars will say there was at least morning, afternoon, evening. Fixed our prayer was individual and communal, day by day. The Old Testament has Psalms where a psalmist references fixed our prayer at least seven times a day. Here's what this would mean. These early first century Jews, the foundation of the church, they oriented their entire life around practicing the pursuit of God together. We would use language for this, like the spiritual disciplines. You might have heard these. The spiritual disciplines, by the way, they're kind of like in a healthy way being rebranded, I guess, right now. They're being called practices. Why? Because a lot of folks, the word disciplines carries the word discipline, which has a negative connotation. These spiritual practices today would be things like Bible, prayer, meditation, silence. For the introverts, that was for you. 
For the extroverts, that was terrible to you. (laughs) Many of us, we don't have a practice of silence. That's why that moment feels so hard. But why are we silent? So we can hear God. A practice of solitude. Well, how would we practice being alone in a culture of constant connection? So we can experience the nearness of God. Sabbath, stopping in a culture of busyness. Generosity in a culture of materialism or simplicity in a culture of greed. These are spiritual practices. But here's the fascinating thing. Instead of taking this new faith and orienting it into their schedule, their rhythm, their life, they oriented their entire life, rhythm, and schedule around this faith. They practiced pursuing God in a disciplined manner, individually and communally. What are we seeing? It is a formation of the family. What is it meant to do? Men and women of beauty, kids growing up at dinner tables of harmony, where forgiveness is felt, but repentance is lived in a beautiful tension. This is something the elders, there's four elders, who lead, I'm one of them at the Springs. Amazing men. We have prayed and thought about this for a long time. Here's why. Here's why. We want to help people become like Christ. So even before Acts 2, going past a year, we have been dreaming and praying, what does it look like to orient a church family around formation or discipleship or health? I want to share with you some slides to talk about this visual. It's really, even in looking on this, it was fascinating as we look at this first slide. This week, sitting there in Pacific, Todd Smith, he's an elder with me. I looked at Acts 2 with him. I said, wow, man. We had no idea how much this lined up with Acts 2, which I'm also embarrassed to tell you that. But here's a rhythm. How do people become like Christ? All right? High level. High level. Feel free to poke holes in it because that's what some of y'all are very gifted at doing. At the center, we've seen this in Pentecost. Holy Spirit, he's the initiator, the empowerer, the helper. But what must you know? Truth. This is doctrines, beliefs, theology, a knowledge of who is God. The next one we'll see, practices. How do I pursue Christ? How do I draw near to God that he might draw near to me? How do I learn to read my Bible and enjoy it? Not walk away bored. Do you know one of the number one things that the disciples asked Jesus to do was teach us how to pray? And these were Jews who already had fixed our prayer. That means prayer is so basic, you can just start it. But so deep, you grow and learn into it. But you see these disciplines or practices. The third one, all throughout community. The fourth one that we'll see, health. As we've looked at this text, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, Truth. The next one, to fellowship. Community at the bottom. To the next one, the breaking of bread. Health to the left. And to the prayers. Practices to the right. And what undergirds all of this? It's this reality. This takes a lifetime, and you cannot microwave deep faith. And on this journey, you're going to suffer. But what is it meant to produce? Beauty. None of these folks had to stay in this room. None of them had to stay on the journey of the early church. They'd been captivated by Christ, changed. Here's my honest thought as I close with this. I think the American church is far more tolerant and marked by this. We are really well discipled in know him at the beginning, trust him, walk the aisle but follow him to the ending. Don't get me wrong. Know him at the beginning. It's a beautiful thing. I'm all for an altar. I'm all about it. But belief is beautiful. But the adventure and the journey is in the becoming until he meets you in eternity. What does it look like to live life to the fullest, the abundant life that he talked about. Yes, it is the power of the Holy Spirit. It is evangelism. It is Peter's preaching and your preaching and missions. It is a life practice of knowing you won't have it all together, but becoming like 
Christ. The reason the elders chose Acts is we feel, I feel, our teaching, my teaching. I share a vision of that. And in our church family, we oftentimes are better at forming this. That's not looking at any other local church. That's looking at my leadership. That's looking at our leadership. We're so many of us. We have that disillusionment that we just feel. I know there's more. That's why so many of us will leave the local church to find the more. We'll leave the local church in ways of we'll go to the Bible study, we will go to the conference, we'll go to the worship gathering, we will go to therapy. Why? The primary place of health and formation is not here. I believe God is doing amazing things in this family. But I'm the first one to tell you we have room to grow. See, churches take on personalities. You could focus on just the role of the Holy Spirit, and you can become the charismatic. You could focus on just the truth. A denomination that would really fit you for that is Presbyterian. I love Presbyterians, right? You could go the route of the practices. Anglican would make sense for you. Or there's a new, cooler term for it called the contemplative movement. It's born out of monasticism. You go that route. Or you can go to community. That's probably us. High life together, relationally, confession, connection, or you can just go health. What that really lends itself to is like a therapy movement. Those are all beautiful, but if you just pick one, they're incomplete. Holistic disciples, mature disciples, vibrant and beautiful disciples are all, over the course of a lifetime, needing one another and refusing to just Settle at belief. Belief is beautiful. We are just invited into so much more. The wild adventure of relationship and intimacy with God is in the becoming. The elders, me, the springs, the members, we have grown from where we were. But we must keep going. If we want to be a family of formation. Father, I thank you for who you are. For what you've done. For how you invite us into a different way. How you do this stuff in spite of us. How like you bring transformation in beautiful lushness. Restoration of marriages. Students coming to know you. You do the whole thing. God, would you keep going? Lord, you are welcome. You lead this church family wherever you would have it go. Your will be done. Your kingdom come. May we be a people dependent on your spirit. That was exciting. I'm taking that as God's affirmation of this prayer. So stay with me. May we be a people dependent on you, spirit. May we be men and women of truth. May we know that we discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness. May we know that committed life together is not optional. And may we be people of reflection who live in real health, who don't bury the past, but don't define themselves by it. Who know what it looks like to journey with you and towards you. We need your help. I thank you that you are such a good help. You are a father that loves. Jesus, you are a brother that helps. Holy Spirit, you are power that enables. May we grow in the divine mystery of Trinitarian fellowship with you and one another. It's in your name we pray.